Hey guys, Mac Ernie here, Jen Gerson with me. Latest episode of The Line Podcast starts right now. Filming this one for you, August the 9th, 2024. U.S. politics, but Jen gets a little existential on them, so we'll do that on the lead. We're going to talk the riots in Britain. We're going to talk bots in Canada. And I have a bold, courageous suggestion that I have not told Jen about. I'm going to catch her by surprise with it. And we're going to see what she has to say about my potentially life-changing idea for all of human civilization. All that and more on the latest episode of The Line Podcast. Well, Jen, I love starting with um, serious stuff, lighter stuff. But unfortunately, this week I gotta I gotta start owning up to an error. Uh, last week, with apologies, I referred to a column written in the Globe and Mail in last week's podcast, and I referred to it as being written by Jeff Simpson. That was a flub, and it's mortifying. It was written by Lawrence Martin, and this is the worst kind of flub. It wasn't a long chain of editorial errors. It was a brain cramp. I. I knew Lawrence had written it. I said Jeff instead. It was just, um, I think I just need a vacation, to be honest. So apologies uh, to the listeners and the viewers and, and to both gentlemen. The line, and me specifically, very much regrets the error. And as penance uh, for this error, Jen has really leaned, leaned into the retro 90s look now, because now you've got nice new round glasses. I do. I, you know, I really feel like I'm leaning into my middle-aged sexy librarian phase. Uh, it's, 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 it's a great vibe for me. No, uh, no, I went, I went, decided to do something really radically different. Normally I do the really heavy duty glasses. Instead, this time I've gone for like really round silver frame glasses and I'm really loving them. Actually, I, I I'm feeling like a very different person. It's great. Um, also I'm, I'm at the point in parenthood where my kid is referring to the 90s as being like vintage. Like this is the 90s. That's old school. Um, like yeah. we went into a 50s style diner uh, close to my house the other day. And he's like, mom, this is this is like the old times. This is like the 90s. And I just died inside. But you know what? The 90s are back. I'm, I'm feeling it. It's, it's a cool thing. I, I'm embracing that. Arguably, the 90s never left. So You've got the earth tones going on there, uh -huh. and yep. all you need is a really outrageously large black cloth handbag, and you'll have the, the look completely uh, locked I'll, in. I'll have you know I did do my fall shopping from The Gap. It involved a deconstructed mid-length mid, uh, denim, black denim skirt, and yeah. lots of tank tops. So I, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm just going to stay here and I'm not going to leave it. This is the place where I live now. You know, we're all retreating to something. Jen's retreating back to the 1990s. In my head, I'm retreating to the 2370s. So, you know what? We all have our own thing and I'm, I'm here for yours. Well, Thank you. I know you have uh, thoughts on this. So I think I'm going to largely yield the mic to you for this segment. But I just want to set this one up. If you go back and look at our recent podcasts, one of them, the headline was prepare for Trump 2.0. Like after the assassination attempt, a Biden's debate flop, I was looking at this as a seasoned political observer, not an American expert, but as a guy who obviously knows U.S. politics. And I was thinking the Democrats are screwed. They, they, they're just not going to have a way back from this. And then they actually pull off, to their credit, a successful candidate switcheroo. I didn't know if they'd be able to do that. Biden withdraws. Harris steps in. I thought that could have been a catastrophe of backbiting and backstabbing. But it actually has gone smooth. What is your read on the state of U.S. politics? Because I'm not putting any bets down. But I'm not convinced, as I was for the first week, that everything we're seeing is this pent-up Democratic enthusiasm that finally has an outlet. The polls are moving. Harris is making this a more competitive race. I still think Trump might have an inside track because he's strong where he needs to be strong. But Harris seems to be contesting this thing in a way I wouldn't have thought possible four or even six weeks ago. Yeah, I would say, like, look, the, the, the movement from um, uh, Biden to Harris is absolutely make, making a difference. The polling is showing that pretty consistently. You've gone from, a, like, the Democrats are going to lose this thing to the Democrats are now running a competitive race. So the thing I would I would just caution people is, uh, on on a lot of both sides of the the political spectrum is that you've got you know the far right going off on Kamala Harris saying well she's a, a crazy um, a Democrat socialist who slept her way to the top I mean the vileness that's coming out of that side on 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 Kamala has been really interesting um, and then you got like the flip side on on the liberal or the progressive side basically 
assured that this is somehow Kamala sanity and this is this is all kind of some kind of genuine, totally organic, um, um, inspirational wave of 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 of, um, of of enthusiasm that Kamala will be able to ride to in an absolutely inevitable victory. Neither of those narratives, to me, strike me as as correct. I think that what you have here is is Kamala's an actual viable candidate in a way that that Biden wasn't. You're seeing a lot of early showing institutional support and money drop behind Kamala as, as needed to happen in order to try and create a competitive race. Um, and I think she's obviously in a lot of ways a much stronger candidate than Biden was. That doesn't mean anything's in the bag. And the thing that I think you've pointed out quite correctly is that if you go back and start looking and digging into some of those polling numbers, you start to find that the Republicans and Trump in particular are still ahead on the key issues that are likely to become the ballot questions in November. So if you're looking at economics, security, um, immigration, those are still kind of the top three major issues. And the Democrats have a sort of institutional disadvantage on those issues. So, you know, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that the coronation of Trump is now no longer assured in the same way. But I don't necessarily think that I would I, I'm switching my bets at this point. Um, the other interesting thing that happened, of course, this week is that uh, Kamala uh, appoints Tim Waltz for the vice president, her, her vice presidential pick. Again, we're watching this from afar. Like, we don't, we don't, I'm, I'm thinking of that scene from Mean Girls where somebody stands up and is like, you don't even go here. Um, a lot of people who are in, intensely interested in politics are very invested in vice presidential picks. It says they, they, they're, they really care about it and who that, who Tim Waltz is and, and what he stands for and what this means for, for, for strategy and what this means for the, the race. I would just remind normal people that vice presidential picks very rarely make any difference at all. They rarely, very rarely, rarely matter. Um, Tim Waltz is not a generally recognized name and the campaign has, you know, dozens of days really in order to try and build him up as a, as a national figure. That's a really hard slog. It's a very expensive slog. So, you know, a lot of people are noting, well, Tim Waltz is this like, is a, is a, is a, is a progressive progressives and, you know, he'll, 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 um, uh, bring the progressives into the fore, or the real lefties into the fore. You know, some of the research I'm reading suggests that actually Tim Waltz is probably most, um, popular among kind of older boomer liberals. Uh, rather than hard lefties. Uh, so he'll probably shore up some of Kamala's uh, flagging support on that flank. And also because he is a, you know, white male dude governor, he will be the sort of person who, can, who the Democrats can send in to uh, deal with races or individuals or, or, or you know, um, hustings walks that you wouldn't necessarily send Kamala into. So it's, it's an interesting choice, but, my, but the overall take that I'm getting from researchers that I trust on this one is, the vice presidential pick says way more about how the campaigns see themselves than they did do about the overall race. And also the pick of both J.D. Vance and uh, Tim Waltz, respectively, is suggests that, that neither of these sides thinks that it can persuade people over from one side of the fence to the other. This is all about mobilizing their internal bases to, to, to get out the vote. So that's interesting. Um, again, from a Canadian perspective, it's just something to watch. Uh, it does mean that I do think you're right. I think that the coronation vibes are, are, are definitely no longer the vibes. It's really interesting that the assassination attempt didn't get Trump and the Republicans as much um, in the news cycle as we thought they were going to. So that's maybe an error on our part. However, I do think that switching candidates in such a historic way did effectively change up the news cycle in a really dramatic and perhaps unprecedented way. So, interesting. The reason why this I, stuff... Before, interests, before we move on to yeah, the existential right. thing, I want to make two pragmatic points. Okay. First, one of the things I'm interested in, and one of the reasons I actually am probably a little more bearish on the Trump campaign than you are, like, I'm not, I'm not betting the farm yet either, but one of the things, and I, I view this as, and I think I'm going to put this weirdly, I view this as a, as a hockey fan, as a sports fan. I'm a big believer in the vibe the momentum mm -hmm. of a game. Yeah. And there have been times just watching baseball, watching football, more so for me watching hockey, where I've looked at a team that is leading and is better in terms of its roster, but I can tell by what they're putting out there on the ice that they're going to find a way to lose the game. There's something that has happened to the Trump campaign in the last couple of weeks, and I don't know what. 
and we could probably interview a dozen U.S. columnists and all get different opinions, but I'm watching this as a sports fan. It's a hockey fan. Something's wrong on the bench. Yeah, there, there's there's unhingedness that's coming out of that campaign it's not, now, right? The, I think that's a symptom of it. I think when teams are losing, they do weird things. And Trump's campaign, even though I agree with you on some of those key issues and key states, they have polling advantages. They're acting like losers. And I don't mean that as a slur. I'm not calling them losers, but the campaign feels like it's losing and it shouldn't. And I mm -hmm. think, mm -hmm. like again, I think about like hockey psychology, when the better team that's up by two goals is takes to the ice and looks timid, I know they're going to find a way to lose. And objectively thinking with this thing, oh, sorry for the, the listeners, I'm tapping my skull there. Trump has advantages, but the way the campaign is acting, I can't explain. And I've seen this before in politics and it's making me think something is wrong with that campaign. Maybe it's bad internal polling. Maybe it's bad fundraising. I don't know, but they're they're the, Well, I mean, I'll use the joke I've been using all summer. They've lost their garumba and I don't know why they, they are not, being effective at responding to the new circumstances. So maybe they get their shit together, right? Maybe they go away for a weekend, they have a big strategy meeting, they fire a couple of advisors, they come back and they win. Very possible. But something intangible has happened to that campaign. And I, I find my sports fandom more useful than my political analysis at understanding that. The other point I would make, and it's a quick one, is when you're talking about all of kind of the assassination attempt and then the debate and Biden withdrawing, I would underline that to you and I as news media professionals as something we should take note of. I don't know if it's because the world has gone batshit crazy or if because there's fewer of us, fewer journalists, fewer commentators, whatever left. Things that would have led the news for weeks a month ago, uh, sorry, 10 years ago, are now forgotten in a month. And Yeah, we're, our, our baseline for crazy has gone up. Yeah. And I have this almost this inherent sense because I get up every morning, every weekday morning, and I have a radio show I host, and I talk with my producer. And the stories he provides me would have led a week of coverage five years ago. And I know they're a one and done in this news environment because I have 100% confidence that I'm going to wake up the next day. And instead of doing a follow-up on the assassination or Israel blowing up the Hamas guy in Tehran... There's going to be some new fucking catastrophe that we're going to be talking about tomorrow. And I don't know quite what to make of that, but here we are. So those are my only, only two points and what you had to say so far. Take me into your existential theory of what okay, you were talking about before. Okay. The, so, uh, like, the vibe, look, so to speak, in U.S. politics. I, yeah, I was sitting here talking with my husband about this. And <clears throat> as I was talking, I kind of had this like new vision of politics or a new theory of politics emerge in my brain. Um, and I'm still kind of working this one out. So it may wind up being a column at some point, but knowing me, I mean, it could be a column next week. It could be a column three months from now. So it's something that I'm still kind of canoodling, canoodling. That's a technical term. <laughs> and that is, and I think that this theory of politics is still I don't, true. Jen, just for the record, I don't think canoodle means what you think it means. Oh, no, I totally use that word wrong. If you and I are canoodling this topic, our spouses are going to have something to say about that. Okay. How about that? Noodling. I'm noodling. Noodling. <laughs> Noodling. There we go. Not canoodling. I think canoodling is like amorous cuddling. Yeah, you're right. It is. It is. That's really embarrassing. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, I'm noodling this one, so I'm still noodling it. Um, here's here it is, and I would say that the theory of politics that I have that I'm working through is still true, even if Kamala Harris wins the presidency. Okay, because I think this is a a broad thing that's happening, and that is. I'm seeing progressives in Canada and America try to respond to fundamentally spiritual problems with material solutions. So a lot of the issues and a lot of the weirdness that's happening around politics has to go with generational change. Who are we as people? Um, what does a lower quality, lower standard of life living mean for us and our kids? Um, you know, how are we going to deal with the atomization of our societies? How do we deal with the super polarized environments that we're finding ourselves in? How are we dealing with loss of institutional trust, right? Like th these really big, deep themes that were all existed prior to COVID, but were deeply catalyzed by COVID and are have now are starting to reach these interesting tipping points and these crisis points. 
I'm going to frame these as spiritual problems. And I'm not framing this, don't mean spiritual in the sense of religious. I mean that they go to, to deep existential questions about who we are and what we're doing here as a society. and what are Questions of identity and purpose. Questions of identity, purpose, and narrative as a society, right? And what I see from a lot of liberals and progressives is here's your new lunch program. I know we'll 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 fix your we'll we'll reduce your we'll forgive some of your student loans. We'll um what's the last one? Here's a new dental program. Yeah, you know, thirty it's, billion it's, dollars over ten years for tr new yeah, buses. Ten years. For we'll create a new EV plant. Yeah, we'll 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 create some localized uh, affordable housing, right? It's an inability to grapple with the spiritual problem. So it's a default to, well, I know, we'll just throw a material answer at the spiritual problem that we're functioning with here. And it's an interesting problem, I think, because I think a lot of um, people who are on the liberal and progressive side have a tendency to be more secular, if not atheistic. And as a result, I think that they have a hard time grokking or intuitively understanding the nature of a spiritual problem. Whereas I think people, ironically, who are on the conservative side, who tend to, not exclusively, but tend to be more religious, if not spiritual, have a language for this. They have a, they have a, um, a way of, of grappling with deep collective problems of meaning and identity in a way that people who are secular or atheistic fundamentally don't, which is why I think that they are intuitively able to connect with the zeitgeist, with the vibe right now, in a way that I think liberals and progressives are kind of struggling and don't understand why they're struggling. That's my, that's my emerging theory of what's happening in politics. I don't know if it's bullshit, but I'm kind of noodling it as I, I think said. it's no, I don't. Um, I'm going to say something to you that might sound critical. I actually don't mean it as a criticism. I don't think your theory is bullshit. I think it's underdeveloped, but I think it's underdeveloped because a lot of us are realizing the same things and grappling with it. And none of us have quite figured it out yet. You right. know, You've typically, I, I, I know you, hey, we're all on a spiritual journey, but you've typically identified yourself as an, as an atheist. I never have. I've always believed in God. I don't conform dogmatically to any organized religion, but yeah, I believe in, in uh, God. And even so, I am very much a Vulcan. Uh, I am very rational, logically oriented. And one of the blind spots I have in understanding political and social forces are matters of identity. Because I view the world very much for like, will this not, will this optimize my GDP per capita? You know, what will this mean for cash flow and service delivery? We, you know, will we get more widgets for the Navy if we do A instead of B? And then other people come along and are like, I feel like Canada has lost its soul. Right. And I look at them and I'm like, I don't understand you. You strange. I don't have a, don't have a language. Yeah what you're talking about which is very which is very now, personally i would also say that i think i'm kind of a lapsed catholic which is, or sorry a lapsed atheist maybe that was freudian right there maybe i'm a lapsed atheist so i I'm, I'm kind of living living in a strange limbo state at this point on when it comes to spiritual matters um i have a blind spot for people who are motivated by questions of identity i don't yeah, understand and I, it and i i have consistently undervalued it so now like a vulcan i'm trying to always go okay all that stuff you don't understand, double your weighting of it mentally when you try to process politics. And I find that helps, but I am very, like, to, I am very much like a, a conservative from 20 years ago. I just want to like fix processes and, and I, matters of identity. Well, we're all Canadians. We're all in this together. That's the extent that I think about identity. And I that's a problem because I think I'm obsolete in that way. And I think I am yeah. missing stuff. And I think that like you're, you're, you might be, you know, you might believe in God, but you, I think your, your alignment and the way that you think about the world is probably more aligned with what I would call secular or agnostic liberalism, um, which I think is far more typical in the milieu in which you, you function, which is sort of, you know, upper middle class Toronto milieu, right? Like the, I'm not saying that is, I'm not saying that is a criticism. I just think it's an yep. observation. Um, not a lot of churchgoers in my neighborhood. No, there's not a lot of churchgoers here. In fact, I would be shocked if you were a regular churchgoer. You know, not that, right? So, um, I think there's a new sort of how should I say this? A spiritual. And I don't know how to describe it other than spiritual. The spiritual is not the right word for it because so many people I'm gonna, are going to hear the word spiritual, they're going to think it's I'm yeah. using the word religious, and I don't. I mean a different thing. I think there's a new sort of 
consciousness that 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 is that is motivating a lot of people in their politics and it is for lack of a better term a spiritual consciousness that is motivating mm. people in their politics um and it's eroding a lot of the old assumptions and creating new ones and i think that if you are if you are not tapped into that it can be almost impossible to understand what the fuck is motivating a lot of the language and actions of the people around you particularly on the conservative side so yeah, I, like I said, I underdeveloped is, I think, the correct way to state this thesis. I think I'm working on it. I think I'm thinking it through. Um, and I think I'm going to try and articulate it as best I can when I have the, when the old fermenting process is done in the back of the brain, mm -hmm. which is kind of where that work happens. So anyway, that's just uh, my, my, my observations about what was happening in the American politics. I'm not expecting anybody coming to the line politics to be coming here for incisive in-depth uh, knowledge about what's happening in american politics because like you know we, we, we don't, don't do that we don't we don't live there man i, <laughs> I still just think for... i still think we should go south around the time of the election i just haven't figured out i haven't figured out a way for us to do that that is not going to be replicating what much what everybody else is better doing. resourced outlets are doing and the yeah, line is quirky right like we need to figure yeah. out like something that is informative but also fun and i haven't figured that out yet like we need to we need to cover the election like puerto rico or guam or something i'm not just saying that because of the weather um but like like something something weird like that anyway um i still we'll talk about it we'll talk about it we'll figure out a way to do this we're also open to suggestions um definitely but, open to suggestions is there but, any quirky way that you want us covering the election i still think my best idea is that we pick we try to get ourselves invited to a party like an, I, I mean i don't mean a political party i mean like a celebration like dinner and drinks and music and a dj where we're confident the person is going to lose and I could hang out with losing Republicans and you can hang out with losing Democrats and just hang out with the losers. Like, um, or what we could do is we could do something like, you know, like, like go to the Republican and Democratic steakhouses in Washington, DC and report on the vibes. Something just, like that. We'll talk like about steak. it, but yeah, we need to we'll figure out something it. that other people aren't doing. So we're open to suggestions. Let's wrap up yeah. the segment, but let me just say to you, um, I, and to your thesis being, underdeveloped but developing i to the extent you've developed it i agree with it and i think i mean a great number of people and i'm using liberal in the small l sense here it's not a partisan comment but like moderate centrists we'll, we'll call it liberals moderate centrists slightly you know, prog people they're kind of like oh i'm so i'm so sure liberal but physically conservative like all of those people or not all of them but a lot of them one of the things I think is happening is that this identity tribal thing that you're talking about is happening and they don't understand it. And I think they have misdiagnosed it. And what I think has happened, and I say this a lot in the context of our federal liberals, but I'm actually going to make this a broader comment now. I think Andrew McDougall wrote a piece for us this week in the line about the, the, the rioting in England. They talked about how the politicians are making it worse because they're talking down to the people who don't talk to help. Don't talk down to them right now. I think something culturally and societally is happening in the West and our democracies. And I think our moderate centrists see it and acknowledge it, but they don't understand it. So the answer they've settled on is like Twitter polarization or disinformation yeah. and things like that russian bots the twitter made them do it and i think i think that is partially a flattering answer for them we're actually great if people weren't so stupid as to buy what the russians were telling them i think yeah that's part of it i think or or, or every everybody who disagrees with me is stupid is a racist or stupid it's a racist or they're stupid if only they could see what's so obvious to me without Understanding that that is in itself its own kind of blinders. You're so I you're... think self-flattery is a problem. Yeah. And I also think some of it's stemming from genuine confusion. People who are wired yeah. the way I am, and they're yeah. trying to rationally explain something that is to them unexplainable. And they're coming up with wrong answers because they don't know what else it is. And I think I th that I can, I think that I'm on the verge of trying to be able to explain this rationally. 
Firstly, the other thing I problem that I have, and this is probably why I'm also increasingly a lapsed atheist, is that the problem with rational people is that they think they're rational. What do you mean? Nobody's rational. Everybody's motivated. Everybody is self is engaging in self reasoning. Everybody is engaged by 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 um, motivated logic. Everybody's engaged in tribalism. Everybody's engaged in emotional based reasoning. Like this is. Yeah. You think that you're a super rational atheist who um, just uh, is smarter than everybody around you? Trust the science. Trust the science. I mean, it's bullshit. You're, yeah. you're just engaged in exactly the same game from the other side. Yeah, and, you, and, you're, and, and you're worse because you're not self-aware enough to see yeah. that you're doing it. Like, that's the problem. That's the problem with rationalists and rational people is that they think they're rational. You're, you're not. Nobody is. One so of the get, let go of that. Let go of that and understand that you have to let go of that as as part of the tools and keys to understanding people who aren't like you. One of the things I think has kept me relatively sane is that I am either by personal inclination or professional experience, I'm pretty good at gut checking myself. I often check my blind spots. And I think I've been aware of the fact that I was missing things. I wasn't aware enough to know what I was missing. But I think in the back of my brain, I was like, there is something happening that I don't understand. But I think a lot of people didn't even go that far. I'm throwing myself in, man. I'm throwing myself into the chaos. I'll understand it and I'll come back with an answer. There was all, if, if one of us was going to throw themselves into the chaos, I don't think any of the it, listeners or viewers had any doubt which one it was going to be. Yeah, no one is surprised by this. On that note, like and subscribe like and to subscribe. Line. Also, Read our stuff, www.readtheline.ca, if you haven't already. That is pretty much how we keep in touch with all of our beautiful listeners and readers and subscribers, paid and unpaid. So yeah. uh, check us out there. Find us in the chaos at readtheline.ca. So we were touching just for a minute there in the first segment about what I had said had been um, what I think has been a, an error that has been committed by our progressives and our, our moderate centrists, liberals, but using that in a, in a, in a Canadian context, a big L, but also in an overall small L sure. meaning where there's been stuff going on societally that they don't understand that they can perceive, but they can't grok as you described it. And it's a great word. I'm using that a lot lately. It's a good word. And since they don't grok it, they're trying to explain it and they've done an all too human thing. They've settled on, the easy flattering explanation and the easy flattering explanation is that the people who are doing weird things that they don't understand and agree with are bigoted assholes, idiots, the lunatics, are at conspiracy the gate. theorists, the threat to democracy is imminent, motivated all by either stupidity, ill will, or disinformation or misinformation, whatever. I think some of that's true. I think it's not it's wrong. Not I just it's think not, it's, it's not. Over. Yeah, no. Look, it's it's that's a part of it. That's there's yeah. there's they're definitely look. There are bad faith actors out there who are pumping and people full of bull and idiots yeah. who are out there pumping people full of bullshit. And the institutional trust has collapsed rightly in a lot of cases, but sometimes wrongly. But the institutional collapse is trusted has dissolved to such an, a, an extent that people are going to different sources of information to get their answers about what's happening to the world around them. That's pretty understandable. Yeah. So the problem is that I that a lot of the same people who who would, will say mainstream media is lying to you and they're all full of shit will, you know, rightly point out errors in mainstream media. I mean, believe me, there are some things that I see in the CBC that drive me nuts too. Um, but then they'll go to they'll look at like the Russell Brands or the Daily Wire and subject none of those people to anything resembling the same scrutiny that they're gonna that they're gonna subject the mainstream media to. And I'll throw us at, the, at that on that particular pillar. You should be subjecting us to scrutiny too. You shouldn't be taking anything we say at face value either. Not because we're going to lie to you, but because we're human and we can be wrong about things. You can challenge us on that. And that's cool. That's how I the opened the podcast with work. a correction and the correction like, was brought to me by a listener. Yeah. Someone said, Hey, man, I love the podcast and I know the column you mean, but you misnamed the author. And he was right. Yeah, he was right. And like, like we try to be really responsive to that because that's part of our duty to our audience and to ourselves. But like, let's say if, if, if you're going to start, if you're, if you're, if your collapse of institutional trust is going to take you to alternative formats and alternative media here, that's fine. Just make sure that you're subjecting the alternative media to the same level of scrutiny and skepticism that you would subject the mainstream media to. You should, you should, you shouldn't be turning your critical thinking blinders off because it's like, well, these people I can trust because they're not the X, right? And that's the thing, the, the error that I think a lot of people make on the left and the right. 
I think the reason I bring this up, other than in the, in the context we were already talking about it, there's been a big story circulating on Canadian political, uh, politically tinged social media this week, and it's starting to cross over into the mainstream media. Pierre Polyev recently attended a conservative rally, and hundreds of Twitter accounts posted identical messages of support, mm -hmm. including Twitter accounts that are nominally in other countries. And someone observed correctly that that is some kind of coordinated social media campaign. And I could clumsy one, by the way. Pardon me? A very clumsy one, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about that. So I don't know. And this is the thing. Let's let's break the fourth wall just for a minute. Jen and I are not partisan, but we are reasonably conservative people in our own politics. We we lean to the right. And we're not partisan. We're actually almost anti-partisan. But I think people believe, I think unfairly, but I think they believe it, that you and I go easy on conservatives and hard on liberals. And I mention that now because I'm about to say something that I know people are going to say is me going easy on conservatives. Mm -hmm. When I saw this story, I did not assume it was the conservatives doing this. And I think this is a broader comment. And I'm not saying this to whitewash the conservatives. I've made many the, the point many times before that I think the conservatives, like most modern political parties, are way too focused on social media. I think social media is the tail that wags the dog. I think it is skewed priorities, strategies, everything. I think it's bad. I, I can tell you emphatically so that that is the case, to a degree that is not healthy. Even so, I think if this was to be the conservatives doing this, they would do a better job. And the conservatives, for their part, as a party, have denied that they've done it. They've said, nope, we don't use bots. We deny this. We don't know who did this. It is possible that the conservative party is telling the truth, but maybe one of the various satellite advocacy groups that are nominally arm's length from the conservatives, but are 100% conservative proxies, maybe they did it. But here's the thing, and I'm not trying to say this to give the conservatives cover. I'm trying to make a broader point. Maybe a liberal did it to embarrass the conservatives. Maybe an NDP -er did it to embarrass the conservatives. Maybe the Russians did it. Maybe the Chinese did it. Maybe the Iranians did it. Maybe some loser did it for a grad school paper because getting a few hundred bots to simultaneously tweet a message is probably 50 euros paid to some bank account in Romania. Yeah, it's cheap and easy. It's totally accessible to do that. And again, I know this will be seen as giving the conservatives cover, and I don't intend it that way. I'm trying to make a different point. You cannot take anything on social media at face value right now, particularly in the context of elections. And I think your point a couple of minutes ago, and I think you were, you were exactly right about this, you made the point that there are people who will savage the CBC for a small error, but 100% accept what Russell Brand will say because they like what he's saying. Yep. There are so many people in this country right now who do the same thing. They will not apply any basic thought or scrutiny to a story that they want to be true. And a lot of people right now want to catch the conservatives in an embarrassing social media flaw. Well, and also the bot thing is is perfect because that fits into a narrative, right? Like the, yeah. these guys are engaged with uh, nefarious social media tactics that explains why they're being so effective and why, the, why they're so ahead of polls. Like, it fits right into a pre preconceived narrative. The other thing I would just point out is like, look, um, coordinated social media responses and to a lesser extent bot attacks are now universally used. I, I don't, like, I'm sorry to say this, but I simply do not believe that there are quasi-organized liberals, quasi-organized groups of, of NDPers and quasi-organized groups of, of CPCers usually in sort of private slacks or private discords who um, coordinate maybe not with the full knowledge and consent of the party, but maybe with something like it um, to engage in, in swarm attacks and mobbing attacks online. I, I just, that is now been a, nor that is now a deeply normalized aspect of our online political discourse. It, it I just, would tell you the time I was targeted by one, but they fucked it up. Yeah, I was too. It was very funny. So what I... happened What happened for me, and it wasn't political, it was I had written a column that pissed off an industry association. Right. 
and members of that industry wanted to do a coordinated Twitter attack on me, but one of them fucked up and uh, put it in a main post instead of a, a DM. <laughs> and I was tagged. It was like, okay, so we're all going to start hitting Gurney at four o'clock. Okay. Is everybody clear on that? And then it was very quickly deleted, but I was able to screen cap it. And right yeah. around four o'clock, dozens of people started to go, Gurney, your column sucks. It's wrong. And I was just like, guys, I just send them the screen t- shot. None of them ever talked to me again. Yeah. So it's... this stuff happens. Well, and also like this happens in industry association. And like, so how, how, I don't think it's actually quite as, as simple as, you know, conservative party buys bot attacks or liberal party buys bot attacks. I don't think it's usually quite that uh, unsubtle. I think normally how it actually functions is that you have a sympathetic sort of what I would call dark forest on the web. So slacks and discords, telegram channels, these sorts of places where that's like-minded... A, that's an interesting pop culture reference. It's a, no, it's a reference to the dark forest essay. Have you not, have you not read that? Are you talking? Are you talking about? I thought you were talking about three body problem. No, 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 no. This All right, my mistake. I'll send. I'll send. I'll send you the link to the Dark Forest essay. So there are there are, it's sort of as social media has cor- corroded into the cesspool that it is, more and more people are 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 leaving the public aspects of the web and moving on to what we call dark forests. So these are semi-private clubs online that are usually affiliated according to interest or partisan affiliation, tribal affiliation, or the like. So. You'll be on a a, a private Slack, you'll be on a semi-private Discord, you'll be on a semi-private message board, you'll be on um, a a Telegram channel. Most actual communication that's happening now, I don't think is happening in public anymore. It's happening in um, in dark forests. Because people know that they can't speak freely and candidly on Twitter, so they don't, right? Like, there's just no point in doing that. And increasingly, the the social media themselves are becoming dark forests as people start to self-sort out of the public aspect, the public domain. So if you're kind of conservative, right, you're probably still on Twitter. If you're, if you've gone to the left, you're on threads or truth social or whatever of those. No, monsters. Um, not, no. Blue sky, whatever it is. Yeah. Blue sky, whatever the F it is. I don't care. Um, and then, you know, if you want to be an influencer or you make shit, you go on Instagram I'm or TikTok, TikTok, yeah. you know, like that sort of stuff, right? Like people are self selecting out of the, the public sphere and into these, quasi public domains, right? Like that's a that's a phenomenon that's actually happening around us. So I think what happens here is that, you know, one person ac- attracts the ire of of a particular partisan affiliation or or one of these dark webs. And maybe there are some official party members in some of these dark webs, but they're not necessarily explicitly coordinating this stuff. But maybe they'll post this thing that they know will be inflammatory to their particular to their particular social network, and people just sort of swarm around it like flying monkeys, right? Like that's kind of how I think it actually functions. And I've been on the the the, the wrong side of a couple of these things over really, and you you know you get a sense from them because they're really weird. They don't feel spontaneous. They don't feel like people. Like they 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 feel like a person who has read what you read or what you said through the filter of someone else's interpretation and then they're they're parroted in a weird way um so they they're they're when you're on the on the receiving end of these they they feel very abnormal they don't feel normal or organic Mm -hmm. um and there have been a couple of times when i've kind of caught I, i too have caught some people out on some of this stuff so that's kind of how i think these things function um now, how many parties are taking it to the next level and buying sophisticated bot attacks? Honestly, I, you know, I can't prove this. I'd be shocked if they all didn't do it. I would genuinely be surprised if all of our political parties did not have contracts with bot farms in order to sway public opinion and messaging. I just think that if they do that, they're probably not going to the cut rate bot farms that are copying and pasting the same message over and over again. They're almost certainly using uh, more sophisticated, more interesting approaches to this. So, I, I, as I, said, I don't assume that the conservatives are innocent. I don't cons- assume that any of these parties are innocent. I just think this particular clums- the clumsiness of this attack suggests to me that it's vi- likely, not impossible, but likely that it's probably another actor in the space. I I was just, I mean, yeah, th- th- that's. That's way better than what I plan to say. Um, 
overall, it's just I'm I'm sounding as a note of caution. Just because it makes your enemy look bad doesn't mean you should believe it if it happens on Twitter. I think all of us as as citizens need to have some civic responsibility and sort of punch up our um, literacy on these issues. Almost at this point, my advice to anyone is if it if you only if it only seemed to have happened online, don't believe it. And I I remember looking into this years and years and years ago. So my my numbers are probably out of date. But it was not so much political messaging, but it was sort of like, hey, Jen Gerson, world-renowned pop singer, the Taylor Swift of her time, is coming out with her new hit single. And as part of the marketing campaign, when the single drops, one of the things they would do is that 50,000 accounts globally would tweet like hashtag Jen Gerson, hashtag single, with all some variations of great song, love it. And those 50,000 tweets would roll out over like a three hour period. And that would generate an algorithmic wave that Twitter would notice. And then you'd be trending. And then other people or get like real human people would see that they'd click on it. They'd hear your song. The cost of doing this was hundreds of euros. Also, I mean, I, I don't remember the I stand with Trudeau hashtag. Of course. Yeah, I, I, I have a hard time believing that, that was a purely organic hashtag. On that note, um, I've got to take a quick call. So on that note, can we like and subscribe? We and can like and subscribe. Can we we'll like and subscribe? come back in and moments we'll back. and we're going to talk about British riots. So like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. All right. Uh, got a friend on Monday heading overseas with his wife and two beautiful girls for a, a two-week trip through England. Uh, Perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> We've been teasing him all week. Um about how basically he's going to like angry middle-aged man found outside pub and it's going to be him being lost and needing directions, but he's going to find himself like identified as leaning far right figure. Look, we shouldn't like, we shouldn't make light of this totally. Uh, what's happened in the United Kingdom over the last 10 days is serious. Three uh, little girls were murdered by uh, a black teenager who had been identified wrongly on social media as being a foreign migrant. He was British born to church going Christian Rwandan immigrants. Mm -hmm. And he was identified as an illegal migrant Muslim from the Middle East and rioting exploded across the United Kingdom. And no one was killed in these riots. Thank God. After these horrible murders of these little girls, um, significant property damage, significant injuries. And I think for the British they're going to have to think about this. Like some, something's gone wrong and the British are going to have to think about this, but that's not what I want to talk about today. Everything I'm setting up is just the context for it. You want to know something I noticed about these British riots? Tell me. They were already sentencing people. Oh, wow. And a Canadian news story that huh. might have crossed your desk in the last week or so is the Coots verdict where of the four individuals who were charged after the Coots raid in the winter of 2022, two of them had accepted plea deals, pled down to lesser charges. Two of them proceeded to trial, and that trial just resolved itself in the last few days. The, uh, the two remaining individuals were cleared of conspiracy to kill police officers. They were convicted on all the lesser charges, possession of weapons, pipe bombs, firearms, things like that. So... That's a controversial topic in Canada, and listeners who are passionate about it may be disappointed uh, by the fact that I have nothing in particular to say about the Coots verdict. I don't know, maybe it's something to mull over, maybe we'll come up with something to say about it later. But I just think, convoy was a while ago. We're recording this on the 9th of August, 2024. Okay? That means the Coots raid was 30 months ago. And that is the time it took us to get from the raid by the RCMP on Coots, or the, or the border encampment near it, to a verdict. One of the things I had noticed a few years ago in a different context was that after January 6th in the United States, there were arrests and investigations and people who had like tweeted pictures of themselves and the Congress were identified on social media and then the FBI arrested them. And it was a couple of months later that we started to get the first convictions. 
where, or people were like pleading guilty. It's like, yeah, I trespassed and I, I vandalized something and I'm going to, I'm going to plead to like eight months behind bars or something like that. And I remember at the time being struck by the fact that, holy shit, the Americans are getting people behind bars within like three or four months of the event. The British are sentencing people within days of the events. I'm not even convinced the riots are over yet. So again, we're recording this on a Friday. It's been the last couple of nights have been calm. That might mean it's over. It might mean it's a respite before the weekend. There's a lot of planned protests this weekend. We'll see what happens. Can you even imagine Canadian law enforcement and then courts getting someone behind bars within days or months? Well, let's let's, let's, let's play devil's advocate. Let's take devil's advocate for a second here, okay? Because oftentimes, I mean, there's a there's a balance to be to be ha- had here, because the I don't think anyone would dispute that Canada's uh, just criminal justice system is fatally and criminally, haha. Uh, long-winded. Um, there is no reason, no good reason why it takes as long as it does to get a, a court case through the system. Um, and of course, we 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 know that uh, justice delayed is justice denied, not only for the victims of crime, but also bluntly, it's also not fair for criminals. Yeah. <laughs> because if you if you're convicted of a crime, you know the amount of time you spend waiting for for the crime, those are that the, the time of your life you can't get back. Your life's right? in limbo. So. Yeah, your life's in limbo yep. until you get those charges uh, resolved, right? A th- three-year um, wait to be sentenced to one year behind bars. Well, in this case, so then you're then you're sentenced to one year behind bars plus time served, so you're free. Yep. Oh, okay, great. But guess what? You've lost three years of your life in order to to pay your one year to pay your one year's head debt, right? Like that's not fair for the for the people who are are engaged. To say nothing of um, how unfair that is to the people who are then later found innocent. Oh, okay. So you spent two, three, four, five years of your life waiting to be found not guilty on a crime or a charge like that's that's bullshit for everyone so there is something wrong here the flip side to that is justice sped along is often justice that's bullshit you know like usually when people can uh fast track someone through a court at that kind of speed it's because they're cutting corners they're cutting procedural corners or they're cutting evidentiary corners so i do we really want people hitting their sentencing within days of being arrested? It depends. I don't, it may be, I don't know, but does that mm. give that person an adequate amount of time to prepare a defense? Does that, does that increase the probability that the uh, evidence in the case might be questionable or faulty? I, I think that's an interesting question to ask as well. I think what the other thing that I think the, is different you, in the di- different, when we're to- I'm not sure it's fair to compare a raid with a riot. Um, because in the case of a raid, you're talking about people who spent several days, if not weeks, collecting evidence, um, infiltrating the group, uh, you know, engaging in stings, engaging in all of these sorts of uh, intelligence gathering operations in order to be able to, um, make those arrests. And then all of that evidence has to be challenged at trial. What about this was valid? What about this wasn't valid? Was this entrapment? All of that stuff has to be kind of be litigated. When you're dealing with riots, it's like, Caught Johnny over there busting ahead. Well, that's that's the UK context that I think is, is relevant here, right? Because the yeah. UK is, is is widely known, sort of like the haven of CCTV, closed circuit television. So, right. Right. what's happening, and I think in a lot of these cases, and I ha- I haven't been reading them exhaustively, but I think what's been happening a lot of them is that like, come Monday morning, looted shop owner hands over his tapes to the yeah. police. And there's Jim and Bill who didn't mask, just throwing petrol bombs through the window. And the cops are just immediately identifying these people, showing up and arresting them. And these guys are basically looking at the video of them hurling Molotovs and it's plain as day them. And the British, in some cases, there was one case I read where the British didn't actually know who it was, but there was such comprehensive CCTV footage that they were able to track the guy from camera to camera walking from the crime scene home to where he slept it off and they arrested right. him in the morning before he'd even sobered up. Yeah. So the, the British- I mean, that's, that's also kind of creepy and dystopian. So I don't know if I necessarily want to live in that society either. I, you know fun. what? I, I don't either. I, I'll agree with you on that, but can we come up with a happy medium where 
Because one of the things I find incredible is like a conversation we have, um, the liberals are actually making progress on this. They have been appointing federal judges and they, they were kind of erasing the backlog that they had bizarrely allowed to become as large as it did. Um, so we are getting the court system back on track. But one thing that I just find remarkable about the, the Supreme Court ruling that was resulting in these cases being thrown out is how we decided that 30 months was the red line for a major criminal trial in Canada, that if it went beyond 30 months, then the cases must be dismissed. That's kind of one of those things you kind of nod, oh, okay, well, that's the ruling, and we plan around it. But then I'm just asking everybody, just pause, record scratch, you know, take a minute. How the fuck did we decide that 30 months was, or pardon me, 29 and a half months was a reasonable period of time to be un, like have no verdict on a serious criminal matter? It's some of these. I mean, actual like child abusers have gotten off on this rule. The most appalling story that I've heard of, and this is a uh, hat uh, salute, hat tip to, to Jacques Gallant of the Toronto Star, who's basically specialized in these stories for the last few years, was a, a minor, a very young girl, single digits, who had been sexually molested by a relative. And the relative in the commission of the sexual abuse had taken video and film. And had used the video and film of the sexual abuse of the child to then further extort more sex from the child, perform sex acts, or all release these videos. The evidence existed. The police had it. He had documented the abuse. You're not going to get much better evidence than that at a trial. But it passed 30 months and this guy goes free. So the guy sexually molests a member of his own family, documents it, and walks free. Because we couldn't get our act together in 30 months. And again, I, I'm asking Canadians not just to be outraged that that happened. I'm asking Canadians to take a minute and think that if that individual had molested his young single digit age relative and produced child, per sorry, we, we get killed in the algorithms when we say that, and had produced video and photo evidence of the crime. That if that man had gone from arrest to conviction in 29 months by the Canadian criminal justice system standard, that would be considered a success. 29 months would be good news. I don't know what the optimum should be, because I agree with you. You need time to prepare a defense. You need time to do review evidence. There might be procedural or court issues that need to be hammered out. I get it. But this might be alongside our healthcare weights might be the apex example of the kind of bullshit mediocrity Canadians have just somehow become accept, um, conditioned to. Like and subscribe. How did this ever happen to us? It totally snuck up on us. Anyways, don't burn shit in Britain. Like and subscribe. So Jen, I've been uh, promising you that I have a bold proposal, a modest Tell proposal. Me. I'm actually very excited to hear this. I think well, I've come up with something that Canadians can unite behind that will help us with these difficult cost of living pressures many of us are feeling these days and will also okay. serve as something that we can unify behind. All right. So let me set this up for you. So you're trying to fix the spiritual and the material. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. That's exactly right. That. It's what I'm yeah. going to propose here addresses a very basic human need. And I think okay. we could do better. And I think it's time. And there's no reason we can't. This is just a matter of will. So, you know that I've had an unusual summer. Uh, for family reasons, it's been a, a very unusual summer, and I've been traveling a lot, been on the road a lot, back and forth. And I was at my home in Toronto this week, and I was feeling a little bit peckish. Uh, it was getting later on at night. It wasn't time for a full, heavy meal, but I was watching some TV, and I wanted a little snack. And what I discovered was because I've barely been at, in Toronto for the last month, was that I had a bunch of bo open bags of chips or boxes of crackers and they'd all gone stale. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was one exception. All right. These are called different things. You can call them soda crackers or saltines or. Yeah, yeah they're the ones that you put in your soup when put, you're sick. That you put in your soup. When you buy a large box of those, what are you actually buying? Mostly air, 
No. Right? Well, no. You were buying four individually packaged oh, yeah. okay. containers of crabs. Right. right. So they, they stay fresh if you open up one. So you can open up one, eat them all, or eat two of them, and then wait a month. And you come back and you still are guaranteed 75% freshness Yes, in your snack. Yeah. Yes. The saltine is a brilliant thing. I am here to propose that we make that a standard arrangement for all snacks. Where we go to larger overall portions of boxes of cookies. Cookies are not really my thing. I'm not a sweet guy. I'm a chips or crackers guy. I like salt. Bigger containers smaller individually packaged portions inside of it. So for instance, just to compare two cracker based snacking options, the saltines versus the Triscuit. Okay. They're both squares. They both got a little nice little hint of salt and they're both good with uh, some dip or pate or maybe just a little cheese on top. All right. If you open your, your saltines or your, your soda crackers, and you have two, you can come back in a month and you still have preserved 75% of your cracker integrity. You have optimized your snacking dollar. If you open a box of Triscuit and you eat two and you come back in a month, you've got stale Triscuits. I am asking Canadians to rally behind me on this. Matt? Larger boxes of Triscuits. Four individually packaged rows of Triscuits. Matt. It's time for us to stop putting up with mediocrity. We can do better. Matt. Matt. Yes. How much grocery shopping do you do at Costco, my friend? The staples. But. Because I don't think that you're the first one who's figured out that people really like individual packaging. Yes. But. Not for crackers. If you go to Costco, you would get two normal sized bags of Triscuits. You would not get double the Triscuits divided into four containers. I just, I hate this idea. And the reason why I hate this idea is because it's radically improving product packaging, which is already out of, out of control. Why don't you just take your crackers, put them in an airtight container? Doesn't work. You don't think I've tried that, Dan? No, I don't think you, you have. You don't think I've tried that? Right. No, I don't think you you need to go. I've to even the got room. one of the little pump to pull the air out of it. Doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, and they work. Yes, they, they do. They, it, it can't go stale in an airtight container. It buys you time, but minutes only. Not minutes. That's a I Titanic mean, that's... reference. Okay, but the pumps buy you how time. Much, how much? Only. How much time do you think the individual wrapping of the crackers is buying you? I, I'm. You know what? I don't it's know. It's not I'm buying you a different... this, but months. Okay, I think that you need a better airtight seal container. I'm going to highly suggest that you go to Goodwill or Value Village, get something with a proper rubber container and the double double thing. It can't go stale in an airtight container. I don't have time for that, Jen. I need a snack based revolution. I just think that this is this is this, it's very rare that you're going to see me get on side for the liberal with the liberal policy on anything, but you are why the single plastics ban is, is, exists. And they're right on this one. All I am saying they're is right. instead of a bag of Triscuits, where Triscuits they're are just haphazardly hand. thrown into them, we yeah. just change things up. We stack them. We bag them. Because I agree with you, the packaging would be more and the, the package would be larger. But I think you would get longer service out of that Triscuit purchase. So even though every individual purchase would involve more packaging, I think we are talking about just optimizing the efficiency. No, you could just put a bag clip on it. It doesn't work. Yes, that works. It felt fine. But it doesn't. It's fine. Stop buying so many goddamn crackers. No. I want to buy more crackers. How many do you need? I don't know. I think you're, Jen, I think you're on the wrong side of history on this one. I think. I have, I have nothing more to say about this matter. I think it's a. Could work with cookies. And I'm not talking like the little individual ones like um, Cheez Its. I don't really like Cheez-Its, but my kids like Cheez-Its. So we get those little, at Costco, we get the little itty-bitty ones that we can put in their lunchbox and they can have like a little snack at school. I'm talking a normal, just hypothetically, a normal box of Triscuits, same Triscuits. Do you have, no, do you, do you have any idea how much time, money, and effort goes into food science, into packaging? 
Yeah. Million, billions, billions of dollars. But who are they, whose interests are they serving? Their own. Well, yeah, but their own in tandem with your with yours. I, I, I really think that the, the food science people are on this one, man. The food scientists and the marketers are kind of on board on this one. This is one area in which I trust the private sector to have our to have our interests at heart. I think, I think Jen, that, I think that I think the public is adequately served with its packaging. It's I don't think it's packaging. I think we can do better. Just buy saltines then. Just buy saltines if that's what you like. I do. I do enjoy saltines. But then I think every once in a while you want something with a little bit more crunch, a bit more flavor. And I think, I think that I think it's summer. It is the summer. We've run out of things to say. I yes. don't think this would ever happen. But you know what? It's are we searching no, it's for never content? Happened. Yeah, we are. Am I serious about this? Yes, I am. Yeah, I just think it's a bad idea. I think it's not a good idea. Aren't there some cookies where you will buy like a box of them and they'll be like in like three individual rows and they're all packaged differently? I think there are some cookies that do that. Just, I, no. Oreos, man. How long do you think Oreos last in my house? Not that long. My little shit four-year-old finds them. That's, like she's, that's she, the thing. She's a bloodhound. She starts climbing up on the counters and like getting into the back of, it's incredible. It's incredible. That's a different you problem. never believe it. And, I, and, and, if and then you they're have gone. And then she takes. I'm she, open she, to them, but it's no. Not and my then problem. she mag she magpies them into the closet, and like eats them and giggles. Yeah. It's just she's a monster. You know it's what she worries. could use though? No. Triscuits. No, no. Unless you unless you're talking about child safe packaging on on the adult cookies, I'm not interested. I don't need that. I don't know, Jen. I think you're I living in the I past. Don't need, I don't need more packaging. In my life. I'm snacking in the future. I'm happy with the level of packaging that I have available to me. Are you though? I am. I have problems in my life. This is not one of them. Well, I wish you then the success of one day being in a position where you have the spare intellectual bandwidth to think about how you should optimize your cracker snacking. Yeah. Isn't that the dream we all strive for? Living the dream, Jen. I'm living it. In it. Indeed. Um, on that note, I think we should say like and subscribe and thank you to all of our line subscribers. Once again, please join us at www.readtheline.ca. This is where you're going to get the top tier primo shit. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is definitely our best. You're catching us at our best. Look, it's August, folks. I got, I'm got i going on holiday next week. I'm just... You know what I did do this week, though? I threw out all my what? stale snacks and I reloaded the snacks. You want to know what a snack reload costs in this high cost of living environment? I know what a snack reload costs. It's not pretty. 78 bucks for chips and crackers. Kind of incredible. And peanuts. On that on that note, I'm going to go make some pickles. Well, you're actually going to can your own pickles? Yeah, I make my own pickles every year. What kind of pickles? Well, I kind of go with kosher dills. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend right. and snack hard. <laughs>